Hello, uh, my name is Tim Brady. I'm the subject advisor for the Computer Science 2020 spec here at Pearson. And I just wanted to catch up with you to go over some of the issues that you may be uh, starting to think about now for summer 2022 in relation to our new computer science specification. So this 2020 spec for computer science GCSE is something that we're really proud of. It's been put together with great care and uh, attention to detail. We believe that it's architected in such a way that you should be successful in delivery, your students should be successful in their learning, and uh, there should be no surprises in the assessment. I just quickly want to just emphasize the importance of the four documents that you see on this slide here. The specification is clearly the starting point whenever you're looking at the content of a qualification. The Getting Started Guide is a hugely useful document to sit and to study alongside the spec because for every section of the specification in the Getting Started Guide is a section that relates to that spec item number and includes really, really useful guidance and exemplification. So the spec and the Getting Started Guide together form a very strong document in terms of helping you to know what you need to teach, where you can stop teaching, and what is likely to be looked at in terms of assessment. The programming language subset is a vital element of the architecture of this qualification in that we've chosen Python to be the vehicle for teaching our young people about computer science. And as such, it was important to scope for teachers and for students exactly how much of the Python language needs to be looked at. The PLS shows every construct that you need in order to get every mark in every paper two uh, that we will write. That's part of the no surprises commitment that we're making to you. When we were putting the qualification together, we made a really, really strong effort to emphasize that this is a computer science GCSE, it's not a Python GCSE. And while we were using Python as the vehicle to put across the computer science concepts, there was sometimes some healthy antagonism in the way that it was coming together. And because of that, we created the Good Programming Practice Guide. So while the PLS is a control document that is part of the spec that will guarantee to you that no more than the PLS need to be taught, the Good Programming Practice Guide puts into context some of the thinking behind this. Take a very simple example, the concept of constants, which in Python does not really exist because Python as a language is very adept at changing the types of variables that are in the language. But what we cover in the Good Programming Practice Guide is that our thinking is that our young people deserve to understand what the concept of a constant is, and therefore we will be introducing it in the computer science learning and assessment and dealing with it by a simple syntactic convention that we will use. That's just one example. There are others in the Good Programming Practice Guide. I strongly recommend that all four of these documents are looked at in detail so that you have a complete and full understanding of the way the qualification is put together. So by way of catch-up, this is the first year of assessment for this new qualification. So there are some elements that I do want to talk to you about quickly now. So paper one is a standard assessment, 50% of the qualification in, in terms of it being a question paper, exam hall type conditions. Paper two is very different. It's on screen. Paper one, even though the, the exam conditions are normal, say, uh, we have sample assessments for paper one, as well as specimen paper ones, set one and set two. So we have three sets of practice papers at the moment on the website. The sample assessment material is not permitted to be uh, locked down, so it doesn't have silver padlock. So set one and set two of the uh, specimen papers are very useful for you to be using as mocks and semi-formal in-house assessments and practice papers. We do have a specimen paper set three ready to be published. Uh, we just wanted to hold off so that we had something coming into this academic year that was still padlocked and secure and in terms of uh, not having been released to, to anyone yet. 
In addition uh, for paper one, we have an exemplar exam material for the specimen set one. This is a really useful document, which is actually looking at example answers for the paper, as well as uh, the examiner's thinking in terms of how the mark sheet is being applied, as well as commentary. For paper two, uh, obviously centres are going to start looking at the logistics of this, which is a, a new type of assessment. So I'm going to talk about the ICE document in a minute. In the same way, we have the SAM and specimen set one and two for paper two. So we have three sets of practice papers, two of which are silver padlocked. We have a specimen set three ready to be published. We also, for paper two, have exemplar work for the SAM for set one and set two uh, paper twos already on the website. And again, this is examples of how students may attempt the questions as well as showing how the examiners would apply the mark scheme along with commentary. We always try to mark positively. So as we always say, you don't need to use just what's in the PLS. It's fine if you use constructs outside of the PLS, as long as they uh, satisfy the requirements of the question in the question paper, students will get full benefit for that. Now, the provisional timetables for summer 2022 are already on the website. There's a link uh, in this presentation, which will go along with the little video. Paper one is Tuesday, the 24th of May uh, morning, hour and a half. Paper two is Monday, the 6th of June in the afternoon. So in terms of paper two and the issues surrounding it, I think it's quite interesting to have a good look at the ICE document. There's a link here and we're going to quickly zip through it. What is likely to happen is that there will be a review of this ICE document. It's not normal at the launch or the um, accreditation phase of a document to have an ICE already, but we felt it was important when showing the uh, qualification redesign to the regulators to have thought through many of the logistical issues. So you'll find that the ICE document as it is, is going to be very useful and a very reassuring read, hopefully. There will be some changes uh, as we get closer to the, the real uh, assessment window. One of which is that it looks like we're definitely going to have the digital upload service ready for the examination uh, window in summer 2022 so that your students work will be uh, able to be uploaded digitally so there won't be any requirement for memory sticks or cd-roms so there are 14 chapters of the ice document and I'm going to quickly zip through them. I think it's worth it because just to give you an idea, a motivation maybe to look through this document better. So it starts off with key dates. This at the moment is a template. And as you can see, we haven't updated what the dates are yet going to be. But what's interesting is that 31st of March will be the time. So end of March 2022, we'll be expecting you to show us your schedule, the examination schedule form. And we'll have a quick look at that at the end. It's, it's just for you to communicate to us at an early stage if you think that you will have to do multiple sessions or whether it can all be handled in one go. We will release coding files for the assessment on the morning of the day of the exam. And we've got several different ways that these can be accessed by the exams officer. And if the exams officer is not available, a designated person in the center. More details will come through later on. There's the examination date and the completed zip folders for all the candidates should be transmitted securely using the digital learner work transfer system. And we're assured that'll all be in place. And I think we'll put more details into this ICE as soon as we have a chance to work more closely with that team and see what those detailed instructions might be. And it does say in here, if the system is not available, that it can be done via a memory stick and posted to Pearson. And then the results day in August 22, we'll have a date for later on. So in terms of general instructions, we're talking that teaching of the subject and revision sessions should be suspended on the day. The start time, which will be morning, does have some flexibility. Candidates who take an examination late in the published start time have to remain under supervised conditions. This is standard practice for exam centres where there are things like clashes in exam timetables. Where more than one examination session is being held, centres must keep an accurate record of candidates present at each session. And that's what the schedule is all about. 
time allowed. It's a two-hour exam, no scheduled breaks, no extra time. But we do here in section 3.4 put some words to account for what happens if there are catastrophic events. The format of the examination, candidates are going to be provided with a hard copy of the question paper. There will be a hard copy of the PLS, the Programming Language Subset, as well as a digital version. And then digital versions of the required coding snippet files. So the examination is, is practical on-screen assessments, which requires candidates to carry out programming tasks using their familiar IDE. In terms of security, it was vital as we moved away from an NEA type of project work that we could convince and satisfy the regulators that security would be sufficient. So here we talk about the fact that nobody should look at the secure coding files before the session. Uh, centres should not examine these. Centre staff should check that the correct ones are in the right place and uh, centre staff should contact Pearson if there are any issues with the question paper, the programming language subset, or the secure coding files. In terms of the general administration of the examination, normal processes uh, are to be followed as laid out in the JCQ ICE instructions for conducting exams on a computer. So we do say in 6.2, must not have access to the internet, must not have access to USB memory sticks. There must be sufficient storage space on the student's work machine so that they can save files. And then standard provisos here about not printing out secure coding files, etc. In section seven, now we talk about before the exam, and this is a really useful place to share with exams officers, your IT people in your center, as well as the teacher, so that you know what needs to be done in advance. And the things that are in this section seven, like setting up the candidates secure profiles and checking that the ID has been properly installed is definitely something worth practicing and definitely can be done well in advance of the live session. We talk about how on the day of the session, the secure code files are going to be released in the morning. And there's some anxiety about this being little time. The fact is the size of these code files make them a very tiny digital asset that needs to be sent around. And we've put together three or four different routes by which they can be sent if there is a problem with the, down with the standard access, which would be downloaded by the uh, exams officer. So do have a look through these. If it raises any questions or issues for you, you just get in touch. And then we talk about after the examination where the students basically would log off, uh, stand up and leave. And then somebody, uh, IT person, teacher or exams officer, it would be probably decided by your centre, would be then responsible for zipping up or archiving the, the work that the students have done, making copies of it, keeping maybe memory sticks uh, with copies on it, certainly archiving the candidates' user areas might be a sensible precaution at least until after all the um, results and such have, have completed. So, so that might be good. Section 10 talks about special requirements, and we do try to make sure that all of these are available. But in certain circumstances, I strongly recommend you make contact with us early to make sure that all of the accessibility actions are put in place. Contingency measures, we talk about what happens if there's a crash on a particular computer or a worst case scenario, a power cut, uh, and how you can suspend the session and restart after things have been solved. Malpractice text there is pretty standard and contact us. There's the, the link to the contact us page and you can always email me at teachingict at pearson.com or teaching computer science at pearson.com. Here's the examination schedule. So we're capturing your center number and name, center address and country, the year group, start time, number of candidates, room. And then if there are multiple sessions, they would be using up these lines here. And then you, you return this along with your job title and signature. It's really a convenient way of having an early conversation in case of complications around the delivery. Nothing more than that. 
And that's all I wanted to catch up with for you today. I hope you find it useful and I hope you're looking forward to paper two particularly. I know we are and I wish all of you the very best. Let's hope for a smooth transition into the assessment this year. Thank you. Bye-bye.